Well, good afternoon and welcome to the webinar. My name is John Mayfield, the Real Estate Tech Guy, and we are continuing on through the month of August 2019, providing some key term webinars from each of the chapters. Again, this is national real estate specific, so it does not matter what state you are located in, the information you will learn from this webinar will help you for the national portion of the exam. And first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for attending. Be sure and like our YouTube channel. We're wanting to grow the number of subscribers we have there. I want you to be sure and tell others if you are in a real estate school around the country that we have some great resources they can watch right here on YouTube to help them study for the exam. Plus, I'm taking the audio portion from the webinar, stripping the audio off, and I'm including that in my podcast. So you can go to iTunes, if you're using an Android device or one of the other smartphones out there, go to Podbean, P-O-D-B-E-A-N, and soon to be on Spotify. Just, in fact, it may be there now, I'm just waiting on the final approval there. but you can take these key term webinars, any, any of our podcasts, and listen to those in your car. I read the nicest note from one of my listeners, subscribers, who was out in California, and he said the podcast had been just absolutely um, wonderful for him as he's driving back and forth. So anyway, be sure and subscribe to our, pod, our podcast. You can, again, find that at Podbean soon to be on Spotify, and we are on iTunes as well. We'd love a five star. And uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check us out at, um, or check, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm at Real Estate Tech Guy. I believe uh, my daughters have set up at Global Real Estate School. I need to check that out as well. But, uh, and we're on Facebook. We have a Facebook page as, as well. But we are going to get right into the webinar because I don't want to waste any, any more time. I've uh, got to give a little plug there to the channels and encourage you to sign up, subscribe, and give us a, a thumbs up. But we want to get right into the information and begin helping you learn the material for the real estate exam. So again, this is national content. And uh, we're going to do a little review, if you've noticed on the last few webinars, and I do that for a specific reason. There's a lot of material and I don't want you to just go through, you know, go through the material and then try to review later. To me, you need to be going through the material each day and also reviewing over the material that you've recently studied. So I have some definitions I thought we would go over that we've already talk, talked about, but repetitiveness is good. So I'm going to ask you first of all, what is a cooperative? What's the difference between a cooperative and or a condominium? We kind of ended with this yesterday. Well, a condominium, remember you receive what? You receive ownership interest. But with a cooperative, you're just getting a long-term proprietary lease. Now, I have my um, iPad set up here, so we're going to jump over here and take a look at this. I'm just going to draw some information out for you here. I want you to remember that on a condominium, okay, a condo, we'll just abbreviate there, you actually get a title to the property. You get a deed. And so it is ownership interest. You may see a question on the exam that says Jones owns a property and he does not pay his taxes and does not pay his mortgage payment if the other owners in the building have to pick up Jones's delinquent taxes and mortgage payments 
what type of uh, property form of ownership did Jones have, okay? Well, if the other owners have to pick up the tab, Jones had a cooperative. I think I spelt that wrong. Cooperative. Let's go back and see. I can tell. C-O-O-P-E-R A-T-I-V-E. I left the R out there. <laughs> a cooperative. Remember, with a cooperative, you get a lease or it's a long-term proprietary lease. You actually get stock in the building and so there's no ownership. And in this case, if you don't make your payments, it's going to fall on the other owners of the complex. Whereas up here, if you do not make your payments, it's total, none of the owners have a problem with that in the condominium development because the bank or the tax, taxing authority will just go after you. All right. So keep in mind that with a, uh, with a cooperative, you're getting stock. You're not actually getting ownership. And if you fail to make payments on a mortgage, if you happen to have a mortgage against your stock, or if you don't make your part of the payments for the taxes and insurance for the building, the other owners will have to pick up your share. But under a condominium, you're actually getting ownership. So if you don't make the payments to the bank, they can foreclose, take the condominium away from you and try to resell it to recoup their money. Okay. Good job. So that's the difference between a cooperative and a condominium. We talked about a limited partnership, a limited partnership. Remember, with a limited partnership, there is how many general partners for the exam? There's, there's one general partner, and the general partner is going to oversee the day-to-day the -day operations. With a limited partnership, the limited partners are what we call silent partners, silent partners. And they have no say-so over the day-to-day -day operations, theoretically. And so if the limited partnership goes bankrupt, the limited partners are only out for the amount they invested. All right, let's take a look at that as well here. I'm gonna grab a quick drink of water. So, with a limited partnership, let's just take a look and see that um, we could have this person, we'll have three people in our limited partnership. Let's have four. This is the general partner. And these three are limited. And we also call them what? Silent partners. Now, let's just say they each invested $10,000 in this limited partnership. The, the limited partnership then goes bankrupt. And, or, or you know, you shouldn't say bankrupt because it's wiping off all the debts, but let's just say the limited partnership just uh, has some financial problems and they now owe $500,000 to creditors. The limited partners are only going to be out. They can only lose their investment. So they can only lose $10,000. The general partner is going to be responsible for the entire amount. Does that make sense? And so just remember, limited partnership, uh, you have silent partners. They're only going to be liable up for the amount that they have invested. 
and there's a general partner who oversees the day-to-day day-to-day uh, -day operations and also the general partner is going to be on the hook for all of the money okay it could be on the hook for everything now we also talked about a partnership just a general partnership and a partnerships when there's two or more individuals who form a partnership to form a business and remember the disadvantage to this is each partner is liable for all of the debts of the partnership remember with a limited partnership if you're a limited partner a silent partner you would only be liable for the amount of money you invested into the limited partnership but under just a general partnership you could be liable for all the debts of the partnership and I told you the story about my friend who had a partner who created a bunch of legal obligations and debts and he became liable for those debts even though he did not create those so very you got to be very careful when you enter into partnerships especially a general partnership because uh, you could become liable for any of the uh, faults or obligations that the other partners would create okay so that's a general partnership now let's talk about a trade fixtures for a minute remember trade fixtures are installed by who the tenant good trade fixtures are installed by the tenant to be used in the tenants business think of a service station or a gas station or a fast food restaurant where they may lease the property from an investor the fast food restaurants going to put in booths and and uh, kitchen appliances and coolers and racks and all kinds of other things well when their lease expires they have the right to remove the trade fixtures remember the tenant has a right to remove the trade fixtures and take those with them if they're not removed by the expiration of the lease then the landlord or the owner can keep those and that process is called a session a session okay remember that trade fixtures are installed by the tenant for use in the tenants business and may be removed up and through the day of the expiration of the lease good job now here's a definition see if you know this the alloidio system remember there were two types of of systems we looked at in chapter one the alloidio and the feudio one we use in america 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 starts with an a and that type of system we use in america is alloidio which starts with a a good job that's how i remember them and feudio which is the king that's where the king owned all the land and would rent it back out to you it's interesting I, I i love to listen to some of the old books from the early turn of the century motivational books and i've been listening to this lady who's a who's a preacher and a motivational speaker and uh, a great book i'm probably listening to it for my fourth time now and she was talking about you know we have to have this mentality to think positive to think rich and i want you to think that as a real estate new real estate professional you've got to see yourself and and think and believe that you are being successful as a real estate professional but she was talking about that poverty the poverty mentality was actually ingrained into a lot of the people's minds that it was somehow biblical or uh, divine to that it was okay to be in poverty and that she said actually arose out of the 
feudal system of ownership because the king did not want people to up, you know, to go into an uproar. The king wanted people to believe and think that, hey, it's okay for me to be in poverty because that's what God wants. And I thought about that and I thought that's so interesting because the feudal system of ownership is where the king owned everything. And you and I were just tenants. Well, not you and I, but you, our ancestors were just tenants. And, you know, she was talking about that's when people really put in their mind that it, it's godly for me to be in poverty, poverty to be a tenant, to, to not own the land. The king's supposed to own the land. And she said that actually arose out of the feudal system of the, the feudal governmental days. And I thought, wow, we talk about that in the pre-license course. So feudal king owned all the land. Aloidial starts with an A. America, it's what we have in America, starts with an A. So that's where you and I can own land, real estate, and uh, enjoy that. Now, we talked about ownership in severally real quickly, one person. I know some people are saying, wait a minute, John, wait a minute, severalty, doesn't that sound like it should be more than one? Well, remember what I told you? S for severalty, S for sole ownership, S for single person. Now, there's one other party, and you may see this on the exam, who takes title to real estate in severalty because they are considered a single entity and that is a corporation, okay? So don't forget that. Now let's talk about tenancy in common very quickly and I'm going to go back up here. Tenancy in common. I'm going to draw this out for you. Remember this is two or more owners. Now what we're talking about here, we're actually talking about how do we take title to property when we purchase property if we're single if we're a business, like a corporation, or if we're taking title with more than one person. And so we, we, we just learned that if you're single, you take title to the property in severalty. How's it vested? It's vested as in severalty. If you're a corporation, you are considered a single entity, so you are taking title in severalty as a corporation. Well, now we're actually looking at two or more owners. And remember, we talked about tenancy in common, and we talked about a joint tenancy. I just lost my, try to go back to that. Just lost my screen, but we're back. We have uh, joint tenancy. Uh, it went off again, didn't it? Let me see if that... Mm, I can go over to the board and we'll draw it over there if we have a problem. And we had what is called tenants or tenancy in, pardon me, by the entirety. Okay, so let's change the color of this pin here so that we can uh, remember with this one, there is no right of survivorship. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? 
it means that if one of the owners dies, their interest would be inheritable by their heirs, okay? Because there's no right of survivorship. The other co-owners do not have a right to the property. Your share would go to your heirs, okay? Now, we also know that this uh, can be equal or unequal interest. And we remember that it is an undivided interest. In other words, you cannot tell whose interest is whose or you know, what part of the property is who, uh, their property. It's undivided interest. But here's how, how you've got to attack these questions. You'll see some of these questions, and these are the more applicable, you know, wanting you to apply. You just have to ask yourself, you have to look at that question and say, well, do they have the right to leave their portion when they die to their heirs? If they do, automatically you have to know it's a tenancy in common. If you're picking up there's an unequal percentage of interest, has to be nine times, you know, has to be not always. They could have equal interest, but these are little keys you're looking for, okay? Now, yes, they could own the title 50 50 50, but something in the question would tip you off to say that could not be a joint tenancy. Either, you know, either they can leave it to their heirs or they came in as an owner at a different time than when it was originally acquired. Does that make sense? And that will go to on the next slide because I want to talk to you about joint tenancy. And remember, with a joint T-E-N-A-N-C-Y, I hope that's right. I, uh, you guys know I'm a creative speller, okay? With a joint tenancy, we have to have this thing called PIT that is required, which is we have to take possession of the title at the same time. And that was the title, right? And we have to have equal interest, I-N-T-E-R-E-S-T. -E -E this has to all take place at the same time. Possession, interest, time, title. So you're going to be able to pick up in the questions little pieces and bits of information that would either say, aha, it said that one of the owners died, so the other owners received their interest because with a joint tenancy, you have what is called right of survivorship. So if we have three owners and one owner dies, remember they all owned one third, and this person dies, now these two own the property 50-50, we know it's a joint tenancy could not be a tenancy in common because with a tenancy in common there is no right of survivorship. So just kind of look at these and figure out what, am, what in that problem is not stacking up to be a joint tenancy or what is stacking up that makes me leads me to believe this is a tenancy in common. And then the last one that we talked about is called tenants by the entirety. This one here, and tenancy by the entirety. And this has to be what? Husband and wife. Definitely required there for that to happen. Husband and wife. Okay. Now, 
we talked about community property and community property. I'm going to come over to this camera right here for a moment. Community property is property that a husband and wife acquire after they are married. That's called community property. So anything my wife and I acquired during our marriage is called community property. Separate property, on the other hand, uh, let's see, I think maybe I didn't have separate property down, but separate property, on the other hand, is property that you bring to the marriage or you inherit after the marriage, okay? But anything the two of you acquire together while you're married is called community property. Things you bring to the marriage and inherit after you're married would be considered separate property and not each state has different laws on that. So kind of keep that in mind. And then we talked about a suit to partition. You know, in that joint tenancy where we have the three owners, let's just say one of those owners wants out. So they, Pitt was there when the three of them acquired the property and one of the owners wants out. In order to do that, they would have to do a suit to partition. And if the court would grant the suit to partition, then, then that person would own their third as a tenant in common with the other two who own shares in, in that property. So it gets a little complicated, but I mean, telling you what, if you can just learn those couple little things I've been going over, you'll be able to pick out the correct answer. You'll be able to take those questions down without a fight and move on and pass that exam on the first time, okay? First attempt, that's what we want to do. So um, keep those in mind. So I'm going to come back over to the uh, other camera here. Unless you all think I look better on, on, on that other angle. I know, I'm, I'm, every day I keep saying I'm gonna start eating better and exercising, and I did work out good this morning and I'm going to this afternoon. Now I just have to make better food choices. You know, the, the buffalo chicken sandwich, fried chicken sandwich always sounds better than the salad with salmon on it but I'm getting there trust me I'm gonna do that all right suit to partition I'm gonna partition off my eating to be more correct to be better all right now courtesy and dower courtesy and dower which one is which courtesy is the husband's rights when the wife passes away and dower is the wife's right when the husband passes away. So you got to just put that to memory bank, okay? Courtesy, husband's rights when the wife passes away. Dower is the wife's rights when the husband passes away. Okay, so keep that. Now we're going to move on to some new material. How about that? Let's talk, first of all, I'll get a clean sheet of paper on my, on my uh, board. Let's talk about the meets and bounds. Meets and bounds. We're going to talk about legal descriptions. And a lot of us think that 123 Smith Street might be the, the actual address of the property. This is just really for the Postal Service and 911. But, but to actually locate a parcel of property, we use what is called a legal description. Legal description. And there are three types of legal descriptions we're going to look at. We're going to look at the meets and bounds.
we are going to look at the government rectangular survey system, and I'm going to abbreviate here, government rectangular survey, and we will look at the lot and block. All three of those. Let's take a look at the meets and bounds first. And the meets and bounds legal description, I'm going to just give you some key tips here. First of all, it's ideal for irregular shaped parcels of property. Why is that? Because it uses, um, it uses meets and bounds. So this would be the POB. We're going to talk about that. And it would go out here to a point, And then it might go here to a point, And then it could go here to a point back down here, over here, back to that point, and it will always end at the point of beginning. See how the meets and bounds is ideal for irregular shaped parcels of property. For those of you listening to the podcast, because you cannot see that I'm drawing this uh, on the YouTube portion, I just drew a shape with that's not square or rectangular at all. I went in one direction and to another direction and back over to another direction and it looks like a big zigzagged cutout piece on, a, on the earth. It's not square, round, or rectangular at all. It's irregular shape. So the meets and bounds is ideal for irregular shaped parcel, parcels of property. Now, it also has this thing called the P-O-B, the P-O-B right here, you'll see that. And we call that the point of beginning, all right? The meets and bounds legal description always will begin and end at the point of beginning. So sometimes on the exam, they will have questions and the legal description will not come back to the point of beginning. They'll like say starting at the old uh, rock pile at the northwest corner or some hickory tree and they'll give you directions and going out and about and if they don't go back to the old rock pile or the hickory tree, whatever they started with, they will ask you, is this a valid meets and bounds legal description? And you immediately say no. Why? Because the, the meets and bounds legal description will always begin and end at the P-O-B, the point of beginning. Now, I had a student one time and uh, I go back out here so you can see this. Um, um, had a student one time and, and they said, there was a question on the exam and they wanted to know what this, what this was called. And I said, I've never heard of that. And they said, yeah, they were talking about, they, they were reading out, trying to remember the question. They said it was wanting to know the first place after where it started and they were going on and they swore up and down that they wanted to know what that place was. This has no name. For those of you listening to the, to the podcast, I actually went out to the very first point away from the point of beginning. In other words, they kept thinking that on the exam they were talking about, you know, the point of beginning goes 100 feet to the old rock pile. Well, they were wanting to know what that rock pile was called. <coughs> Excuse me. And I said, there's, there's no name for that rock pile. What they were probably referring to, and you, you just read it incorrectly, was the point of beginning. 
they wanted to know what the first what's the first place called in a meets and bounds description and it's called the point of beginning so don't think that there's some magic word for that very first place you stop at in a meets and bounds description there's there's nothing called that you there is a point of beginning and there is and the legal description always has to end at the point of beginning <coughs> pardon me so I tried to tried to hold it over the microphone there so trust me that that very well could be on the exam that you have an example of a of a legal description and it doesn't come back to where it started it's not a valid meets and bounds description why because this legal description must always begin and end where at the point of beginning so it's ideal for irregular shaped parcels of property it is also um, has a couple of other and I don't know if you would see these or not but if you saw the word meets m-e-t-e-s I'm going to jump over here and I can show you meets refers to distances do you see that right there to distances and bounds give directions so meets m-e-t-e-s refers to the distances in the meets and bounds and bounds refers to the direction so a meets and bounds legal description now you will also have and I, I didn't put this on as one of the words there but sometimes you might see um, uh, other items here and you can see right there the word monuments they're used to identify the corners and monuments are considered fixed objects they could be things such as trees stones streams or man-made objects like highways now I had a student that recently said they had a question about monuments and there was something referring to a rock pile or something and he wanted to know could that be a monument and what did we just read there it's right here and I can't draw on this but uh, it's right in the middle of the let's see maybe I, you can see maybe I can it's right there <laughs> they're used to identify corners they're considered fixed objects things such as trees stones streams or man-made objects like highways all right so don't forget that now let's go over to the next word and i'm going to find that here that we have which are principal meridian lines principal meridian lines and principal meridian lines run north and south baselines run east and west now before you turn off the channel and say I give up this is too much stuff to know you can do this okay do not quit you're, you're going to hang in there because I have a really easy simple way to remember which way principal meridian lines run and which way baselines run well principal meridian P and M run north and south P and M are right next to N in the alphabet for north and south right <laughs> baselines run east and west and the B in the alphabet is closer to the E so therefore baselines run east and west 
principal meridian lines run north and south. This is part of the government rectangular survey system we've jumped into now. But don't let that scare you. See how easy that is? Principal meridian lines, north and south. P and N are right there. Base lines, B and E are real close together in the alphabet, run east and west. So let me go over here to the board. I've got a, we'll just really use all of our resources here today at the school. As I get another drink of water and I'm coming over here to the board and we will do a little bit of studying for the government rectangular survey system. So the government rectangular survey system. Oh, I already, already messed that up. I always hated when my teachers abbreviated in school. So I'm going to try to just make sure I. So let's do this. The GOV. Government Rectangular Survey System. Now, we already talked about our uh, principal meridian lines, didn't we? And they run north and south. Remember, P is right there by N in the alphabet, okay? And our base lines run east and west because B and E are real close, although that would be west. But we'll put, that's how we're remembering that, right? We already talked about that. Some other key things you need to know about the government rectangular survey system. We need to talk about townships. We need to talk about sections. And <clears throat> I'll probably think of a couple more things as we get here. Now, a township is six miles by six miles. And a section is one mile by one mile. Okay, I'm going to draw this out here for you. So make sure you kind of have this in, in check here. So let's come over here. And I think you should be able to see this. So I'm going to draw a township. Kind of small here. But we're going to... Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. I think I need one more. We'll put that right there. And then one, two, three, four, five. So I think this is correct. And I'm going to label these off. So for those of you who might be listening to the podcast, I have drawn a square and I've put six strips across and six strips up and down, and I'm drawing numbers in each of the, the squares that I've, that I've made. And there are going to be, hopefully, <laughs> 36 squares. And we started, for those of you listening and those of you watching as well, we started in the northeast corner with the number one. Then we proceeded to go west, and this is a top row, and we went two, three, four, five, six. Just imagine looking at the United States map and New York was number one, and Seattle, Washington is number six. We went across the country. Now we just drop down to the second row, and we go seven from Portland, Oregon, to 12 over to Boston, okay? 
I'm just trying to give the people who are listening an, a visual of this. Then we drop down to Washington, D.C. and go 13. And we go all the way across to San Francisco, 18. We drop down below to San Jose and go 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. And we're over in Virginia somewhere or wherever. And that repeats back and forth, okay? So what I'm wanting the folks that are listening to the podcast to understand is we started in the northeast corner with number one and we proceeded to go across you know, to the west and we came to number six and then we dropped to the second row and seven is right underneath six. So people want to say, well, why didn't they go back over here and start number two back on the other side? And you have to remember they were doing surveying back then and they were carrying these chains and all this equipment. And, you know, they were probably the boss was saying, OK, let's go back over and do this again. And one of the workers said, hey, boss, wouldn't it make more sense if we just started here and we went back that way and then we didn't have to pick up all of our equipment and go to the other end? And the boss said, that's a great idea. Thanks for sharing that. And that's what I don't know if that's why they did it or not, but it's probably uh, some reason for that. But remember, this is a township. There's 36 sections in a township. And I told you that it was six miles by what? Six miles. And a section, which is each one of these, there's 36 sections inside the township, is one mile by one mile. So this would be one mile by one mile right here. Now, you need to know those types of, of questions. Those could be possible questions that could pop up on the exam. Uh, another thing you need to know, might need to know, is that the proceeds from Section 16 went to the school system, okay, for that particular area. One other thing, then here's a possible test question. I've seen or heard about this. I shouldn't say I've seen, but you know, you hear about things that go on there. But here's a possible test question. Sam Smith bought um, just one second and I'll have this for you. Um, he bought one square mile Sam Smith bought one square mile and five acres for $2,000 an acre. How much did Sam pay for his property? Well, here's another question or another piece of information you need to put in your, your memory bank that one section right here, which is one mile by one mile, is also equivalent to 640 acres. So if you s saw a question that said Sam Smith or whoever bought one square mile plus five acres and they paid $2,000 an acre for it, they basically bought 645 acres and you just multiply 645 acres, 645 times 2,000 and they paid $1,290,000 for that. 6.45 times 2,000 equals $1,290,000. That's why you need to know this information to, to make sure that you understand and you can pick up. So they're you know, that's a kind of a clever way to throw that in there. But if you'll just remember that each section or one, each section, which is a mile by one mile, contains 640 acres. All right. I think we've covered everything we need to know here. I'm going to jump back over to the other camera.
And I want to remind you very quickly that um, can you use more than one legal description on your deed? And the answer is yes. And, and so what we're talking about here is when you purchase real estate, we already talked about, well, how do I take title to that real estate? Well, it depends. Are you single? Are you taking it with, you know, with, a, with a spouse and it has to be tenants by the entirety? Are you taking it with someone else and you're not married? If so, do you want to have the ability to leave yours to your heirs? Well, if that's the case, you want to take it as tenants in common. Um, if you're buying it with someone else and you love them a whole bunch, but you're just not married, but you're like, look, if something happens to me, I want you to get my part of the property, then you take it as joint tenants, right? So we're looking at how do you take title to property? We've talked about that. We've talked about the type of title. Is it fee simple absolute, that purest form you can have? Or are there some restrictions that might you know, create it or make it be what we call fee simple defeasible? We've studied that on the podcast. And now we're just saying, okay, we've got to plug in since you're buying this real estate, where is it located? How do we find it? We can't just use the U.S. Postal Service. <coughs> Excuse me. Pardon me. Uh, we can't just use the U.S. Postal Service address. That's just for 911 and the, and the post office. We need, a, we need what is called a legal description so that we can find that property uh, through the use of a surveyor. So meets and bounds may be one way to do that. Again, ideal for irregular shaped parcels of property always will begin and end at the point of beginning. Or you could use what is called a government rectangular survey system. And we've learned several little key pieces of information there regarding the government rectangular survey system you need to know about. But you can use more than one legal description for the deed. Okay, so keep that in mind. <clears throat> now, um, and I see we've almost been on for an hour here, and my my uh, and my other computer's on low battery there, but um, we'll we're about to wrap up here. The third type of legal description that we want to talk about is called a lot and a block, and sometimes you may uh, have a legal description that says it's a lot twelve. Block H, Town and Country Subdivision. I listed a property just this week and uh, have a showing on it tonight. And believe it or not, the lady who's showing it is one of my former global real estate school students. She's been doing a great job as a real estate agent. So uh, I, it would be really cool if she sold one of my properties. That would be thrill, uh, kind of neat. Although I've had many of my past students have sold properties of mine and many are very very good successful agents but um, it's kind of cool that she's a recent graduate from global real estate school so she's showing one of my properties I just listed this week and it was a lot and block legal description so you can have lot and block you can have meets and bounds you could have a government rectangular survey system. And don't forget little things like with meets and bounds always begins and ends where? Point of beginning. Meets are your, we talked about meets and meets were the, uh, I believe meets were the distances and bounds were the directions, okay? And monuments, Remember that could be a, a natural, you know, could be rocks or a tree. It could also be a man-made object like a highway or something like that. So we're going to keep building on these definitions. And um, I hope it's okay that I repeat some of these because I believe it's so important for us to, to go back over some of the key terms. Now, as I move through the course and we wrap up, I'm going to go back and I'm going to pull out my hundred, well, maybe not a hundred, but 60 or 70 key definitions you need to know for the exam. And we'll just have those bullet points, little key tips that you can 
recognize and distinguish and be able to answer those questions, okay? Now, here's your homework. You like our page on YouTube. You tell somebody else to go like our page on YouTube. I want 100,000 subscribers. It's a big it's a big chore when you only have 190 or 181 or 182, but we can do it. I can do it with your help. So you're going to do that. You're going to go out to iTunes or Podbean or both and subscribe to my podcast and like us and give me a five-star review. And you're going to tell others to do the same thing, right? Okay, good. And so uh, Global Real Estate School on YouTube, uh, because I am sharing this on some other social network sites, go out there, subscribe to our channel. I need you to do that. And then don't forget, you can also follow me on Instagram at Real Estate Tech Guy. And I think you can follow at Global Real Estate School as well. I got to find that out for my daughters who are such a help to me, Anne and Alex, I appreciate all the help you're doing and uh, input that you provide for me. Well, I'm going to go over here and tell you thanks again for listening to the podcast and watching us on YouTube. I'll be back tomorrow. It's going to be Saturday, but I'm still going to do something for you. It might be short and sweet, but we will be back tomorrow and each and every day through the month of August and maybe even continuing after that because I'm having a blast doing this and hope that uh, I can continue to give you lots of cool resources and information to help you pass the real estate exam on the first attempt. Thanks again for watching. Really appreciate your business. Have a great day.